The Huskers were burned by second-ranked Michigan and lost 45-7 on a scorching hot Saturday in Lincoln. With a short week of recovery and a road game on the horizon, how will Nebraska rise from the ashes? We'll recap the loss and look ahead to the rest of the season with our special guest, Counter Read publisher and writer Aaron Sorensen. We'll also check in the latest on recruiting and even learn about a couple whose dedication to the Scarlet and Cream is unmatched. All that coming up and more next on Big Red Wrap. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Severe and welcome to Big Red Wrap Up on Nebraska Public Media. Michigan came in with the measuring stick and Nebraska came in short going against the Wolverines. We're joined of course by Jay Moore and Sean Callahan. I think you like to measure yourself against greatness, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what Michigan is. Mm -hmm. Now Nebraska knows where they are Absolutely. and where they need to go, right? Yeah, that measuring stick, they got... They got you hit with the measuring stick. Yeah, I was going to say that. They got a, it was a dome shot with the measuring yeah. stick. Um, yeah, you could look at it if you want to say, all right, where does Nebraska stand? I think Michigan is one of the best top four teams Definitely. In, the, in, the, in the country. They'll probably be in the uh, college football playoffs for the third straight year. Uh, and Nebraska is very far off. Uh, from a physics, uh, physicality standpoint, from a, a talent level at important positions, I'm talking offensive line, defensive line, quarterback, oh, yeah. and uh, and it shows. And I think you ran into an issue as well where Michigan, and we discussed this last week on the show, they definitely underperformed for the first four games. So now is the first time they, t you know, you got tested. You're on the road at a hostile environment, and you know Nebraska was coming up with the number one rushing defense in yeah. the nation, and yeah. and motivation. You know, Har yeah, Harbaugh. Harbaugh got with them, and they got they got them right. And they said, "Hey, we've uh, we've vastly underperformed. We got to get going. Otherwise, we're going to be in for, in for a dogfight." And on the on the flip side, uh, Nebraska wasn't ready for that dogfight, and it showed. You know, it just was. It, it showed right from you know right when it turned fourteen nothing. That that ball game was over. Unfortunately, do you think it was motivation preparation? There are some people that said they just weren't fired up enough for the game. What did you think it was? I, I think there was a little fear. And the margin for error, as we know, is not much for Nebraska. And yeah. they, they played hard that opening drive on defense. Michigan made plays. I mean, there could have been two balls picked off maybe on that first drive. The first yeah. one of those balls got tipped. It's floating in the air. The touchdown was in a double coverage. I mean, they just made plays. Then Harburg throws his pick, and all of a sudden it's 14 nothing before yeah. you could blink your eye. And I, I just think at that point, you, you think about the past and this program and some of the things, and there's just not a lot of experience. And you know what's on the other side. This is a college football playoff team that easily could have won the national championship last year. Yeah, and yeah. we know Nebraska at that level, but I think Matt Rule said it best. Like, they need to show up and, and still fight. I mean, Nebraska should have played better than they did. Um, you should not have lost that game 45-7. to seven. Yeah, I mean, and actually, it could have been worse. They, they pulled their starting quarterback mm -hmm. in the middle of the third quarter so he could go on a silent and kiss his girlfriend. I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, honestly, it could have been much worse. With the loss on Saturday and a short turnaround this week, there's much to talk about. We can't do it without you. Connect with us and help our conversation. The call room is open and running, manned by our sports intern, Hannah. Wave, Hannah. And students from the University of Nebraska's College of Journalism. They're joining us throughout the season, usually enjoying Valentino's Pizza. Not this time, but they're taking your phone calls. You can also text and email us your questions to BigRed at NebraskaPublicMedia.org. We're scanning the social media as well. Share your thoughts on any of the Big Red wrap-up accounts, and we'll answer as many of the questions as we can for you tonight. In last week's sideline survey, we asked you which Big Ten team you are most looking forward to this season. Not many of you were too excited about Michigan or Illinois. You're smart. But you were excited about Iowa. We expect that in Wisconsin as well. Not a surprise with 45% going to the Iowa game. If you missed out last week's survey, make sure you go to our website now and vote on the new one, which asks which statement best describes your outlook for the rest of the season. There's still a chance at the Big Ten West. The team will at least be bowl eligible. Ask me after the Illinois game. And there's always next year, 48% right now dominating that poll with there's always next year. With that, let's dive into the game and what we'll discuss went right, went wrong. Uh, before we get to the game, what's a Sunday practice like after playing a game? Have you done that? <laughs> have you been in full practice? Full no, I, no I, I can honestly say I have never, I have never been in pads, full pads. The next day? The next day. At any level? At, at any level. Have you had a run, like a hard run? Yeah, so like usually when we were at Nebraska, we, had, we came in on Sundays. Yeah. And we, you know, we come in at like noon, eleven o'clock. You would lift. You actually went through a, a pretty good lift. Mm -hmm. You'd run. We're, I'm talking like we'd run like eight cut two hundreds, so a hundred and back. And yeah. It wasn't like any crazy, you know, pace. And then you'd clean up, wash up, go up to the film room, and you'd watch the film with the coaching staff. And mm -hmm. then you went home at like four o'clock in the afternoon. 
Uh, then Monday was off. Monday we had Mondays off. Okay. Never in my life was have I ever put the pads on a day after game. I've heard stories. I was telling Sean before the show. I had a good buddy uh, that played at Purdue with Joe Tiller, mm -hmm. and they he did that to him. I, I what season it was, but he got they showed up and says, "Hey, that was not acceptable. We're going to." The, Get get padded up. We're going yeah. out and practicing. And uh, he said they played a lot better that next game, but that was uh, that was very unique. But I think he's he's just trying to send a message and yeah. saying this that the performance was was unacceptable, and we're better than that. I, he said I think he firmly believes that they're better than a forty a thirty eight point loss to right. a really good football team. It so seemed, things got to change obviously right. and rather quickly. It seemed like the players kind of agreed that they didn't do what they needed to do and they kind of understood the Sunday practice fully Patty? <laughs> well they only they only had 46 snaps of offense. Yeah, I mean right. it's not like they even played a full game of snaps. Right. I mean yeah. you think about that I mean the, the reps they had and, and so much of it was kind of stress-free by the end of the game because Michigan had complete control of things so um, yeah, I, I think the players responded to it. But even Tony White said he'd never been a part of something like this before where they strapped it up. But I do think being a shortened week. Now, if they weren't on a short week, mm -hmm. I'm not sure they would have gone that hard on Sunday. Uh, but because they travel on Thursday right. and you have to have everything done in Lincoln for the, I mean, they'll, they'll do something on Thursday here. Um, but you, you're kind of up against it already because of the shortened week. Yeah. So. I know the last thing you want to see is a bunch of big plays happening over your head, mm -hmm. but it's got to be worse as a defense when you have so many methodical drives. They were beating them with five yard, yeah. seven yard, eight yard gains over and over again. Yeah, it was just simple. I mean, it was handed off left three, four yards, handed off to right, yeah. five, six yards, hand up the middle, and it was just leaky yard. It just looked like Nebraska was in a de decent spot, yeah. but then a missed tackle, the running back would do a good job of, of breaking that first initial contact, falling forward for five or six. Now you're, you're second and four, second and three. That is not where you want to be as a defense. That's so hard to call uh, a defensive uh, schemes because you're just behind the chains now, and boom, you had a first down, and it's just rinse, repeat, and then yeah. you try to get aggressive, and that's when kind of the big plays happen. That's when, you know, the McCarthy touchdown run and, and you know, the big passes as well. So yeah. it's just, uh, just could never quite get going defensively. Not having Reimer, losing Singleton early. Of course, you haven't had Cam Leonard for a couple of weeks. Those are three of your, three of your better players, at least for the first couple of weeks of the season. Well, and Deshaun Singleton um, goes out the second play. He had been the best guy on the back end, arguably, mm -hmm. and he'd played over 95% of the snaps back there. So him going out that early in the game, that was a blow because he had brought a physical edge uh, at his size. I mean, he's as big of a safety as this program's ever had yeah. in terms of physical size. Um, and to have him go down the Reimer situation here at the hotel Saturday, expecting him to play and he goes to the hospital with an unknown infection right. um, so they had some adversity hit with really you could argue maybe two of their five best guys um, when you ranked guys and Cam Lenhart's been one of their best pass rushers um, you, you hope he could be back this week uh, hasn't dressed though I mean that you know he's worked out before the game though right and then they determined that he wasn't good to go yeah and, and he just hasn't been out I mean so you got the sense oh he'd be ready but um, I don't know if he doesn't want to not play at 100% you know, you've heard rule make comments. Some of these guys want to be at 100% when they sure. play. Uh, they don't want to be graded out playing at a lower level because they're not 100%. Uh, but they need a pass rusher. This defense um, has kind of fallen off as far as the sacks and the pass rushing goes. And right. uh, Cam Lenhart was one of their better guys. Yeah, no sacks the last two weeks. Let's go over the offensive side. Hiram Carberg really didn't do anything to say he didn't play well, right? I mean, he, he I know he didn't run a lot, but yeah. I think he threw the ball okay. He found some guys open, made a yeah. couple of big plays. Yeah, other than, you know, his the low the low, you know, release, release point. Yeah. yeah, that was that's that's an issue and that's going to be an issue, you know, especially when you're dealing with bigger, more athletic mm -hmm. teams as we're going to see in the Big 10 going forward. So, but yeah, I mean, he had the one pick. That was, you know, that was a, you know, he was hit and that was a tip ball. So, the lineman's dream. Right. And <laughs> so, he, there were some good throws like this one, uh, it, this right here, I'll break this play down in the huddle. Like that's a good, yeah. I mean, that that linebacker was dropping the covers there, but he luckily had a good enough pocket and they only rushed three, but able to kind of hold on to it there and yeah. wait for Billy Kemp to come open on this choice route and make a play. So he did, he, I mean, a guy like Heiner Carberg, he did what he was supposed to do. And um, it's just, you can't, you know, when you get momentum going and you have third and two, you can't have penalties, get yourself third and seven. And that happened way too many times with this offense. And that just throws you off of uh, schedule and, and you get no points coming out of it as well. Well, they had 8.8 .8 yards to go on third down by average. Michigan had 4.4. You're not going to win that battle with third downs. How'd you think Harburg played? How'd you think the offense overall played? I thought as a thrower, it was his best game. I mean, the decisions he made, he looked in rhythm. The pick obviously was 
um, a deal with his arm angle, but he's got that baseball background growing up as a yep. kid. So I think he's kind of got a, you know, that Patrick Mahomes baseball player style. Um, but yeah, I thought Harburg, each play gets better out there. Um, now, team, Michigan took away his running ability, the way they uh, defended him. Um, they didn't have a lot of design runs, maybe one or two in the game. And then he had the one scramble you saw there. Um, so this was the game where his running was really taken away, which forced him to make more throws. Uh, but Anthony Grant, not having him be a factor, I mean, that six carries, there's, they're not going to beat anybody yeah. if Anthony Grant only has six carries. They had 60 more yards than Michigan was given up on average. And they got to about where seven points is what they've been giving up too. So it's mm -hmm. kind of average. You remember that 2018 game against Michigan mm -hmm. when Nebraska goes in with an injured Adrian Martinez and they kind of beat up on Nebraska, kind of the same physical feeling compared to this year? Yeah, I mean, that's that's similar but different. Uh, it's Frost's first year. Yeah. You know, this is Matt Rule's first year. Um, that Michigan team's, I don't know if it's as good as, as the 2018 Michigan team is. I don't know if it's as good as the 2023. They had a better defense in 2018, though. That defense was loaded. They, no, they had a lot of guys. They, there was definitely some some good players. Very very similar. It's just, again, you get off to bad starts. And for Nebraska to have a chance, Michigan had to play poorly. Yep. They had to turn, turn the some, ball over. Turn, turn, some ball over to turn the ball over. You need to get some special teams uh, points somehow. And that just didn't happen. I mean, Michigan, they had one penalty all game. And they just played clean, no turnovers. Yeah. And that's just Jim Harbaugh right there, clean, consistent football. Give me something good. <laughs> I mean, Brian Buschini punted well. Well, I think the Big Ten West is good for Nebraska. Oh, yeah, it's I mean, wide I, open. I think th as you look ahead, that's as hard as it's going to get. You exactly. have seven straight games now where the team is not ranked. That has never happened since Nebraska's been in the Big Ten Conference. Mm -hmm. um, so they've got a manageable stretch here where they've got a chance every Saturday from here on out. This was the one where you knew – on paper, Nebraska was greatly outmatched. And I think the other games will be closer, like what we saw against Minnesota, where it's going to be a coin flip. It's going to come down to execution, turnovers, mistakes. And that's why Nebraska lost that opening game of the year to Minnesota. You could argue that's why they lost to Colorado. Um, if they play like they did the previous two weeks before Michigan, they're going to have a chance in a lot of these games they're playing. You expect to see Jeff Sims play? I think so. I think you will. I think if he's get, getting healthy and he needs to be, you know, having that ankle has to be able to throw off of it, drop back, and, and you know move that pressure mm -hmm. uh, from the back foot to the to a, the front foot. And he's got to use his legs. We know we in this offense, we like, you, you want to be able to run the quarterback, and that's part you got to utilize that um, inside of his offense. So if he's able to um, play, I think you're going to see him on on I almost said Saturday, but Friday night against Illinois. No doubt about that. Now there were some glimmers of hope as we mentioned, but a lot of the improvement is needed for this team to be competitive at the top of the Big Ten Conference. Something that's evident when you look back at the game, and sorry, we're going to do that right now. We're going to look at the highlights. It was an extremely hot game. As usual, Field Stadium, the sea of red right there, uh, didn't last very long because it was so hot. A lot of people, especially in East Stadium, decided to leave when it got underhand. But that first drive really showed what Michigan had. J.J. McCarthy comes out running for nine yards here. Actually hasn't run a ton coming into this game, but you can see how athletic he is. Yeah, he's, he's good. You don't see, you know, not uh, identified as a dual threat, but when he needs to run, he can definitely do it. Yep, 30 yards or carries, uh, yards for the short day that McCarthy had. There's Blake Corum, who's one of the best running backs in the Big Ten. And then right behind him, you have Donovan Edwards, who's also one of the best. He ran hard. He did. He, did, he ran hard. I think he was a little upset he didn't get the amount of carries so far. And he showed. I mean, you just saw right there, leaky yards. He had a guy in a position. And uh, Luke Gifford was in a halfway decent position here and just couldn't get his head turned around. I know a lot of people say turn your head around, but in this situation, as soon as his arms go up and his eyes get big, you've got to go through the shoot. Yep. You've got to yeah, go through you, where his hands yes, are. Yes, you got to you got to get the hands in the way. Yeah. The rule of thumb is on man playing man defense. If you see the ball thrown, you're going to see the ball caught. Yep. So you just got to try to play his hands and get your hands in the way. Yeah, if he'd have got him through there. Okay, here's your defensive line of dream, right? How yep. many interceptions did you have? I had one. There you go. I had one career one career pick, Iowa State, 2005. You get a tip right there and get the interception. And of course, Nebraska already down seven nothing, and here comes Michigan again. And as I mentioned, that one-two punch at running back is just as good as you're going to find in the Big Ten. And neither guy's been stressed all year. I mean, nope. they've they not pushed those guys to a high limit yet. Yeah, talking to the reporters from Michigan, they say that they they really want to see Edwards get going. And here's the third back, his first touchdown of the year for Mullins. He scores. He had five carries for 43 yards in that touchdown uh, on the day, so up 14 nothing. JJ McCarthy comes back again. Plenty of time. What's going on with the pass rush? You know, not having Cam Lenhart, uh, it's just hard. You got to, and I think 
Prince Wealth came in and provided some decent rush later in the game. I think yeah. you'll see him play more. But it's just been, Matt Rule said it, there's good enough, there's guys that are good enough to play, but they didn't need to show up and do it against the elite competition, and uh, they just didn't do it against Michigan. A couple of passes there, big tight end, and then one right here to Cornelius Johnson for 20 yards. He had two receptions for 32 yards on the day. And then you mentioned this earlier, a lot of small five, eight yards, but then a couple of big ones, and here's J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, just get some Nebraska. I'm gonna break this one down here in a second. The huddle. It was. It's, there's a bust defensively. It's, you have rush lanes that just were not kept, and uh, this let him. And you get man coverage. You'll see this. This whole right side just opens wide open, and mm. and not much you can do when you have everybody on the. You have five guys to the. You know, to his left, and he could. Uh, he just hits his head on the goalpost. And that was his first rushing touchdown of the year. Before that, only Blake Corman had a rushing touchdown. Get a TFL right here. Ty Robinson makes a nice play. Yeah, finally. We saw some <laughs> ties show up and make make a play, and and uh, yeah, it's just one of the sm few highlights that the defense had on Saturday. Yeah, and then tackling two in the open field, Nebraska had been so good at it, and you said you mentioned leaky yards from those missed tackles for the most part. Right here again, that was a stop again. that another three yards after the tackle that leaky yards that Damon was talking about last week. This is an incredible throw. Watch him square his shoulders here, yes. like you're supposed. That's textbook throw. That's I mean that's. That's, that's next ESPN level. That's draft highlight yeah, day right that's, there. Exactly. That's next level throw right there. It was impressive. After halftime, we come out, and you know Nebraska had been really good in the second half, and you're hoping that they make this throw. I know you're going to – this is uh, Marcus Washington. Almost had a chance to have another one of these later, and the ball was knocked down. Yeah, again, it's just – you've seen it. Harburg made some good throws. And again, this situation, Nebraska gets going. But what they do, to get on third and two, get uh, false start, and yeah, then fumble. you can fumble, and – Right here, actually get the back, but yeah, they get the false start next play, boom, come back, and miss the field goal. Yeah, Tristan Albano right now, I know it's not, people are saying it's not confidence, but he needs to see one go through. That he? was a tough wind he kicked into. The it was. south wind was in his face. It was. But he's got to make them, you're right. Yeah, he's got a big leg, we all know that. Um, he misses that, it stays 28 nothing. And then the last drive of the game right here for McCarthy, he comes in, makes a couple of really nice throws. I think they probably told him, you get a good drive here and you score, you can come to the bench. And he did that. Blake Corm again with another good run, that time for 15 yards. That was his longest run of the day. And then a one-yard run for a touchdown to make it 35-0. Corm now has nine touchdown rushes on the season and zero catches. He is running for them and nothing else. That's what he's doing. Tuttle comes in now. Jack Tuttle uh, makes a couple of plays. Their second string quarterback, a couple of completions. He hits Morgan for eight yards. And then they have a field goal. Nebraska's defense actually bows up a little bit and forces the field goal here to make it 38 nothing. At this point, you're just hoping Nebraska gets some points, right? Yeah, that shutout streak from 96, you're here. Everyone's watching that. And I mean, the way it broke, we'll, we'll show that play here in a, in a bit. But yeah, you, you just, you don't want to see a shutout of Memorial Stadium. I don't, I don't even know when the last time that happened would have been. Well, that was 1968. Uh, second, third to last game of the season against Kansas State. I think they lost 19 0 in that game. That's a, or 18 0. It's the last time they've been shut out in Memorial Stadium, all the way back to 68. They bring in a backup quarterback who drives again. This is a big guy here, like 6'5, 230, who's their backup quarterback, DeGaulle. He's third string quarterback, actually. First touchdown catch of the season for Patrick O'Leary, or Peyton O'Leary, excuse me, gets his first touchdown catch of the season as well. Four different players for Michigan scored their first touchdown of the season in this game. Then you get the kickoff return, and they praise Tommy Hill for being physical here. Yeah, uh, Coach Rule really is a big Tommy Hill fan, and, and just his competitive nature. Uh, can play receiver, play corner. He's their kick returner. I mean, they want him to do everything, and this is the surprise play of the game for Nebraska. Josh Fleeks, you almost had a look at the roster to make yeah. sure you knew who you were watching here. A guy who got sent home before this camp started because he was overweight. Looked pretty Let good that there. that man eat. He looked pretty good right there. No problem there. <laughs> Let's go to the final stats. You can see just how dominant Michigan was in the game. Not a surprise. When you look at the stats, how well they played. Two coaches meeting there in the middle of the field. 249 yards rushing. Only 106 for Nebraska, which is more than what Michigan's given up. 199 more than Michigan was giving up as well coming into the game. And then earlier, we only, again, one, um, one penalty and eight of 13 for third down. Um, that's one of those that you, it's hard to beat those stats. Let's go to Jay now, who's in the huddle. All right, when a game like this, 
and it's a blowout loss. I try to find some positives and try to highlight guys who I thought played well in, you know, in not a great situation. I thought Billy Kemp was one of those guys who showed up and did some good things on Saturday. So we're going to look at this play early in the game to kind of get some offense going. He's lined up here on the hash, which is into the field. Now I say into the field. The ball's on this. So this is the boundary. This is the field side, the wide side. So we're gonna hit the, as we hit play here, Heinrich gets a great pocket, right? Good protection. They're only rushing three. But you see this linebacker here does a good job of kind of dropping in his vision and getting underneath. But we're going to see a little choice route here by Billy. He double clutches it, but a good, a really good throw by Harburg here, stepping up in the pocket. And a good job by Billy Kemp getting open, makes the catch right in the middle, does a good job. Thought he might be able to turn it on, but the, that uh, safety had an angle on it. But a good job to get some offense going. I thought Billy Kemp played really well on Saturday. So next play, we're looking defensively. Now, Excuse me for all my arrows here, but it's, this play is a mess uh, defensively. So this is that uh, J.J. McCarthy run, uh, TD run, that we, t we saw early on the highlight. So we're going to get everyone kind of going. We're going to bring pressure. We're bringing six guys, so we're dropping five in coverage. Everyone's going this way. We have one guy to his, to his throwing shoulder. As you can see, there's a bust somehow. I'm not sure what if Ty Robinson needs to come or the linebacker, but this is, you're not supposed, this is not supposed to look this way. Because like I said, just like you have rush, um, run gaps, you also need to have rush lanes. And this is just poor, undisciplined football by the Nebraska defense here. You get your guys in the back end and man coverage. They, they can't see the quarterback. So now he's able to come free. You had one guy up top come there, uh, Buda right there. But just not great defense, and J.J. McCarthy almost hits, hits his head on the goalpost there. One of the things that Matt Rule talked about was at least three, maybe four of them were busted coverage for the touchdowns. Mm -hmm. So if they just played like they're supposed to, it doesn't happen. Yeah, that play is just, it just didn't look right. There's just not, you're not supposed to have essentially five guys on one side of the football there. That's just bad, that's just bad ball. You'd like to think some of those guys in the situation could have recognized that and like, yeah. okay, this isn't right. Like Ty Robinson doesn't need a wrap. It's like, okay, there's too many dudes over here. I gotta come around the other side. Right, no doubt about that. Jay, we appreciate the breakdown. We look forward to seeing you in the huddle again next week. We're going to go to a short break now. When we come back, Erin Sorensen will join us from Counter Reed. She'll join us on the show. Before we go, though, here's a look at some of the scenes from the weekend's games, courtesy of Herd at Sports. Michigan's an excellent football team, but we could have played better than that. Um, and then I say we, I say we, because that's not me throwing the players under the bus. That's all of us. And I don't think there's a guy in that locker room that doesn't feel that way. We came back, you know, Sunday. Again, we don't ever want to be reactionary. That's what, that stinks, you know. But I think that, you know, we attacked it head on and really 
you know, peeled back what was the, what the issues were, and, and we're attacking them as coaches and players. Usually on the day after the game, we go and do a walkthrough, like kind of like go over the next week's looks and just kind of more like like a mental day and kind of get our bodies moving. And uh, when we were told to put on full pads, we knew what to expect and we knew that we had to go out there and um, physically go against each other and just, you know, go to work. We're in the process of finding out who's one of us right now. Um, the guys have, I think we've responded pretty well. Um, we had really physical practices. Um, all the guys know that what happened last week wasn't ac acceptable. Um, so we got to change that. I love our guys. And I, all I want our guys to do is play football with confidence. I don't want them playing football afraid to lose. Play football with confidence. And so that's my job. I haven't gotten it done yet. So I'm anxious to play on Friday. There is a way you're going to play football in Nebraska. Okay? And that was not good enough on Saturday. Period. So we got to get it fixed. Those are a few comments from the coaches and players following the loss. Now we welcome in more comments about the game. Aaron Sorensen joining us from Counter Reed here on the panel. Aaron, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Isn't it weird how they make an announcement about a big deal, spending a lot of money, and then they get blown out? This is, it's like it's happened twice now. Yeah. It's not good timing. I mean, the last time made a lot of sense because you wanted to take advantage of college game day being in town. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, this one was definitely a little bit of a different circumstance because they were trying to get in before the October Board of Regents meeting. Right. So, uh, yeah, unfortunate timing all around. But, hey, at least there was something people could maybe be excited about for 24 hours. Are you hearing excitement? Because I've heard a lot of people kind of critical of the amount of it. Um, I'll, I'll throw my wife under the bus. She thought it was ridiculous that they're going to spend that much money on the stadium with the way the team's playing. What are, you, what are you hearing from people about that? Yes, there's definitely some critical, like there's some people who are critical, mostly if they don't know what's going to happen with their seats. A lot of people in South right. Stadium. I was trying to also remind people that not even South Stadium, but when this is all said and done, there's going to be people, especially in East and West, that won't have seats anymore because the widening, widening of the seats for the chair backs is going to change. We're going to see about a 10 to 12 percent reduction in total capacity right. so there's there's definitely hesitation there however at the same time when you start talking about that extra maybe like leg room and space the chair backs that's where people get excited especially when you talk about maybe higher concession like quality mm -hmm. um, just like the experience itself I mean Trev Alberts was the one who said we have people who aren't going to concession stands because they're afraid if I go try to get a piece of pizza I'm not going to be able to get back right. to my seat for a quarter that's what they have to fix. So there's excitement primarily in those areas. What's the biggest thing you want to see in the stadium? Oh, just to be able to do this sounds so <laughs> no one's going to understand. I, I'm really excited about the 360 concourse and yeah, being, being able to walk, walk that stadium yeah. really effectively. Yep. They said that. I was like, I'm in. I'm You're sold. In, yeah. What's the price tag? Yeah. <laughs> the South is just like its own like island in there right now. It is. Yeah. And it's so hard. You hear I mean, horror stories, people who sit over there. I have a horror story. It was actually at Nebraska. The volleyball day at Nebraska really highlighted some issues. And some friends had gone over into South Stadium to say hi to some people, try to get back to their seats in oh. North Stadium. And the problem was, is because their tickets were different and they they weren't they were basically told you're gonna have to go all the way out and right. come back in and they're going yeah. we're gonna miss things so it really highlights that there's some areas that need to be addressed yeah well it's gonna get addressed and I don't understand why they're not gonna put up a big screen on the south side should they should right they're gonna spend that much money let's put up a big scoreboard on the south side but that's not happening I mean they don't know yet I don't think they've really okay because it's not in the diagram so I was I will say I did ask Trev Alberts I was curious you know what would happen with the spring game in 2025 and 26 and right. he did say the plan is to play them inside Memorial Stadium construction mm -hmm. and all he's like we yeah. might be sitting on heavy machinery right. but we'll be in the we'll be in the building so I'm just imagining all of us now sitting on just like cranes yeah. watching the game so put in a big screen too that was 2005 right was it 2005 spring game where they were doing north stadium oh uh, close and they only I had mean, about thirty thousand for it yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, was completely think, shut yeah. down i yeah. mean they could just move it to seacrest <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'd be like a little tight no, what great, about not. a what about a game in arrowhead stadium or somewhere do you, or do you think that's just too detrimental to the economy of lincoln to even think about having take a home game take away? a home game out of the city of that'd be tough i think it would be i think it'd be fun for i mean as you see like when anybody does those those like kind of like neutral ground yeah. games but for lincoln so much revolves around a game day that i think mm -hmm. they're going to do everything they can to keep things local but it'd be fun to see it was that 98 or 99 where 98. they played oklahoma 99 mm -hmm. that was at and it was Arrowhead, sold out. Right? Sold out. Oklahoma Mike State. Rucker made a tackle at the end of the goal line to save the game. So, yeah, it would be kind of fun, no doubt. So, 
about middle of the second quarter, you saw some people, because it was really hot, start leaving, especially East Stadium. Your thoughts on just the way Nebraska came out and played? A lot of people worried that they didn't come out with the right motivation. I had somebody who called me delusional after the game because I had said I expected more from the defense. I really did. I thought the defense, I understand Louisiana Tech, Northern Illinois, but I really thought the defense would come out and at least hang around for a little while and maybe push Michigan around just a little bit more than what we saw. Sure. Uh, and that that is something that I, I don't take, I don't consider myself delusional for at all. I really thought that that is something that we should have saw and hearing what Matt Rule, Tony White, everyone said afterwards, they clearly missed they missed the boat on what they were supposed to do as assignments and everything else. And so that was for me, I, I really thought I was going to see a, at least a much tougher defense and that surprised me. Yeah, I agree. I expect the defense to come out and play much better. Uh, but I wanted the word patience. And a lot of fans don't seem to have a whole lot of patience right now nope. for year one. Wh where You want to talk about being delusional potentially too? <laughs> but where, where's that, I'm just always kind of, confused and always like, what do, what do you expect in year one with for the new guy taking over a, a new system where they expect so much more and they're just getting disappointed and and they don't they're running out of patience already in year one I think where you're seeing that lack of patience for fans and I appreciate Matt Rule addressing this a number of times is he always talks about I have nothing to do with what came before me but I understand that the reason that people are feeling the way they are is because of the results that they've had in years past. He's he's keenly aware of that, that that's playing in here. And I think people were really hoping to see, honestly, I think a lot of people would be feeling very differently if Nebraska had beaten Minnesota. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that sure. game would have changed things, at least overall, that trajectory ever so slightly. I think that Minnesota loss, and especially now with how Minnesota has played, has changed that impatience a little bit more. And I, I, I don't actually, discredit fans for anything that they feel at this point. It's just really hard because a year one is usually a kind of take what you will from it. Yeah. But because of what has come prior to this year one, I think people are just more impatient than really ever before. I would say though, I remember right after the BYU game, Mike Riley's first game, there were already people chirping. <laughs> the defense was so bad. They had some clock management issues. So I think we've gotten to a point now where it doesn't matter who the coach is. Mm -hmm. People are going to be impatient quickly just because they want to see good football. And we didn't see good football on Saturday. Yeah, and that's what Matt Rule has been alluding to the last couple of media t opportunities we've mm -hmm. had with him where he's like, I, I don't want my players, I just want them to come out and not play like they're afraid to lose. Right. I want them to just play football. Give fans something to take away from it and know that this team has what it takes, even if they don't win. He said that. He's like, if Illinois is the better team, okay, we'll take that. But like, we should not be coming out acting like we're afraid to lose. We should be coming out and giving people something to watch and playing yeah. because it's football. Just play football. And that it clearly is a tough hill to overcome for this team because this is a team that hasn't been to a bowl game since 2016. And when you think of like that, just not having that experience for a number of these players, yeah. they're coming into these matchups just honestly always thinking about the worst it feels like versus the what could be if we played, just played our game. When you hate to put a lot of pressure on year one, but the schedule, I mean, seven straight games now, no ranked opponents, yep. and you start to kind of look ahead to the, the Big Ten. I mean, there's, what, six of the top nine teams in college football are mm -hmm. currently going to be in the Big Ten next year. How important is it that they squeeze something out of this seven-game stretch? They really have to do. I mean, really, at the end of the day, this team needs to get some wins under its belt and just to build even just confidence before heading into what will come. I just think... This Nebraska team has the talent, but Matt Rule does say that they don't have enough talent. They have to recruit. They have to continue to grow this team. Uh, it encourages them to be a better, more disciplined team. But that's not going to get easier when you have the USC's coming in, the Oregon's coming in. So this is time. Honestly, you're a team with nothing to lose. Go out there these next seven games and give it your all and get some wins. You might end up bowl eligible by the end of it. Yeah, there may be one team, and I know they're playing Ohio State this week, but Maryland looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And even with the loss, if it's a close loss this week, I wouldn't be surprised if they're, they're 26 ranked. right now. In the yeah, game. I wouldn't be surprised if they're ranked, if they have a good game in there. But, and they're tough to defend. We, overall, when you look at the comments that people are making, how much do you think it is about that people didn't necessarily think that Matt Rule should have been the guy? Like, there were a number of people initially like, Matt Rule, he's never won games against ranked teams, and what's he really done? It's the smaller, you know, at uh, Baylor and Temple. It seems like that people weren't all behind him. You think that that's why it's a, a quicker 
patients I, thing? I don't think so. At least, at least not in like my Your what circle? I have seen. What I mean, I could just be on a different side of Twitter and the internet than other people are. But I feel like when I see that, a lot of them are coming actually surprisingly from former Carolina fans who are coming along oh, yes, to say, upset. "Told you so." Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> otherwise, I think a lot of people are more just you just feel a fan base that wants to have something to cheer for that's truly what it is they want to be able to be in the stadium and be in the conversation we brought up that ohio state game when okay, college game day you're on the biggest stage mm -hmm. and it just didn't feel like nebraska competed you get this michigan game and it just doesn't feel like nebraska competed i think fans could accept losses sure. if they felt like the team was competing or at least, and not, I'm not trying to say that the players weren't like putting, but like they just want to see something that they haven't seen in a long time. Aaron, how complicated is the quarterback discussion oh, long yeah. term? Um, you think about Jeff Sims has another year left. Hyden Carberg's young. And if neither one of those guys is really the future of what they want to do, like how do you think they go about addressing that? Or how should they go about addressing that long term? And Because and, it's complicated. Yeah, listening to you talk about the quarterback, I, I, the thing that really stood out to me against Michigan was not seeing Jeff Sims come in. And the reason I say that is not because you pull Heinrich out, but at some point you get you get to a Play point in the else. game, well, why not? Mm -hmm. um, but what stood out to me about this is in previous weeks, Jeff Sims was warming up as the number three quarterback. Yeah. He warmed up as the backup quarterback this week, but yet he still did not come in. Now I get it, high ankle sprains can take a while to heal, so that could possibly be a piece of it of like, we don't need to throw him out there against Michigan's defensive line and have the worst case scenario happen here because for Heinrich, he was dealing with the left side of the offensive line, not giving him a whole lot. So he, you know, you're not trying to get your quarterback injured. But at some point, if both of them are healthy and you need to figure it out, maybe you start doing a dual situation where you play you play one of the two, depending on, I don't know. Because to answer that question, is Jeff Sims at Nebraska next year or is it Heinrich? You're, you're making kind of that decision right now, whether you want to be or not. Yeah, I think the, one of the number one priorities is finding a quarterback for next year. I think yeah. that's, oh, I would agree. You have to go in the portal Most and get definitely. it. Tell us about Connor Reed. Tell us what you guys are doing. Yeah, it's the whole premise is Nebraska sports story is well told. And so, you know, you know, Brandon Vogel, he dives into numbers and oh, data yeah. more better and more efficiently than anybody I know. Uh, and I just have been doing my best to just continue to tell good stories, talk to people and like the question to Trev, hey, are we going to have a spring game in the stadium in yeah. 2025? So that's really the hope is just to tell really good sports stories and continue to add to a really great Nebraska media beat. I, look. There's so many great media beats on this. Oh, yeah. And even thank you to the fans who continue to show up and tune in and read and everything through wins, losses, everything, because yeah. they're the reason we get to came. We got new chairs today oh, in the wow. media room. Really? Oh. Oh. Desks, tables, fancy oh. plugins at fancy. our seats. Jeez. Yeah, we're spoiled now. That's awesome. I, I hate to do this to you, but what's the final record over the last oh, gosh. <laughs> Ooh, so two and three right now. Yeah. I'm going to say five and seven. Not going to make a bowl. I don't think they're going to make a bowl. Oh, Aaron, man. Look, here's the thing. If I'm wrong, yes. that's great. Tell that me great. I'm wrong. That is I don't true. care. That I will not true. be the mad at you. The margin is so little. It is. I think, it but is. honestly, yeah. they could be seven and five, and I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Aaron, we appreciate it, and good luck with Connor Reed. Oh, thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. We'll have a new winner this week's game day photo contest. Michelle sent us the photo with Little Red at the game on Saturday. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing a great picture with us. Don't miss an opportunity to send us your best game day photos Sweet. for chances to win great prizes like these throughout the season. We want to see your best game, your game day best. So make sure you send in those photos from your tailgate, inside the stadium, even from your watch party as well. You guys have your meetings. Yeah. All right, now it's time to look at what's going on in social media. Our Nebraska public media sports intern Hannah joins us. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Did you were you out there in that heat? I was not. No. Good, good, because that was rough. Heard tell us hot. what <laughs> tell us what happened on Facebook and on social media. Yeah, so on X we got this uh, first tweet by uh, Christian. Uh, it's gonna be one of those games, and we have the classic character Mrs. Puff from SpongeBob. Oh yeah, like, oh the teacher. Tune. Yes, yeah. and so that is definitely all the Nebraska fans out there sweating in the heat <laughs> and at the score. So yeah, got Good that call. going for us. Yeah, and then the next one we have is from Nick. After this game. I kind of just want to sit on the couch, cuddle with chicken wings, and watch anything but football. It kind of sounds like he went through a bad breakup, but over the Husker game. I completely understand <laughs> that. It was tough for everybody. Hannah, we appreciate it. We'll have more social media again with you very soon. Now we're going to go to break. Before we do that, we're going to have a lot of uh, discussion happening throughout the show. Next up, Sean Callahan talks recruiting, and then we preview this week's game in Champaign. But first, more views from the Michigan game, courtesy of Herdette Sports.
we get a wrap up, it's time to check in on this week's sideline survey. What best describes your outlook the rest of the season? 55% of the people are already saying, as Cub fans said for so many years, there's always next year. 24% asked me after the Illinois game, and then about 16% for bowl eligible, and only 5% saying they have a chance to win the Big Ten West. Joining me now, Sean Callahan to talk some recruiting. Where would you vote, Sean? Ask me after next week. I think the Illinois game big. is big. I think this game against Illinois really decides kind of the direction the season's going to go. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Let's talk about the people who was in town visiting for the Michigan game. Yeah, it was a really big recruiting weekend. Um, I found this interesting. 14 of the 26 commits mm -hmm. were here. That's as many as I've ever seen at a game for Nebraska. Then you had all their younger commits there. Um, some bigger, younger targets, though. Darius Dixon mm -hmm. from Modern Day. Uh, Modern Day has eight players in the top 100 on the roster uh, for it. 24 and 25. They're the number one high school ranked team. He's the fourth Modern Day player of that eight that's now visited. So uh, they're doing a good job of getting the top players from the region and some national guys here. Now they got to win. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, I mean that's, that's the next step. And convince them. No, no, let's talk about Roger Gradney. Yeah, Roger Gradney was one of the first commits of this recruiting class. A four-star guy, a dynamic athlete. Had some injury issues. I believe a hip was the, the problem. Um, but he's a very, very elusive guy that can return kicks can play safety, could probably grow into a linebacker. Um, really a true athlete that's coming in as a safety that could maybe, you know, be a, a linebacker type, kind of like what you see Javin Wright or, mm -hmm. you know, some of these guys that play, but uh, jumped on board early and they got him on this class. So you see the speed um, and, and what he brings. And I think there was some thought that it was going to be some work to keep this guy, but they've done a great job of keeping Roger Gradney committed in this class, even though a number of other teams from his part of the country have tried to get him. He's bigger than some of the small, the fast guys they've gotten before him too. Yeah, oh yeah. And yeah. I think he's bigger than that height and weight right now. I think right. I think he's grown and he's got a great yeah. frame to build on. Let's talk about one of the best players in the state, Teddy Rizak, who every time I watch the kid play, all he does is make big tackles and, and do everything he can to make West, help Westside win. Yeah, I mean, it, the Rizaks, it feels like we've been watching them play for years oh, yeah. because they're three-year varsity players at a high, high level, which is rare. And, Anthony, his brother, is the quarterback. Teddy's a tight end, linebacker, athlete, yep. uh, committed to Notre Dame. Notre Dame came in. Al Golden, their defensive coordinator, came in the spring and watched him work out and just fell in love with him. Said, wow, uh, this guy can run. He's a legit 4-5 type speed. Um, he's got a great frame, great head on his shoulders. Everything we're looking for. And they didn't hesitate. They offered him. Then Nebraska offered shortly after. But yeah. the, the Irish had a leg up. They had a, a visit. They went down to South Bend had dinner and met with the coaching staff, the family. Uh, Notre Dame really hit it out of the park with Teddy Rizak to get him on yeah. board. And I'm guessing we're gonna be seeing that West Side Warrior team on this channel uh, here next month sometime. Yeah. And they went to the Ohio State um, Notre Dame game. Anthony went and Teddy went and the top player from 25, that linebacker. Christian well, Jones. That he went as well. So Notre Dame is just trying to get in our, in our kitchen. Yeah, Notre Dame is always in you. Know, Carter Nelson, too. I mean, right. the, yeah. uh, they, they had a coach in Elgin, Nebraska, one of the re recruiting staffers, to right. go watch Carter Nelson play Friday night. Wow. Uh, but Carter Nelson has been in Lincoln three weekends in a row. Yeah, he's going to be here. Sean, we appreciate it. Now we turn to a story about a couple who originally bonded because of their love for the Huskers, a love that continues to grow and keeps them traveling all the way back from Florida for every single home game. Memorial Stadium status in Nebraska is unquestionable. A true touchstone of the state. The stadium has become intertwined in the lives of Nebraskans. Memorial Stadium's ability to connect goes beyond the playing field. The very first day we met, we both loved Nebraska football. And our kids loved Nebraska football. My mom. Denny and Joyce Kornick have a unique connection to the stadium that brought the two of them together. My father bought two tickets in 1929 during the Depression on the 50-yard line halfway up in the West Stadium. I think he paid 50 cents. That's 90-some years that those seats have been sat in by my father's relatives. I signed this 1954. My number is 31. Memorial Stadium to me is probably more important to many people because 
I ended up playing here. I did not only play football, but I also played baseball for the University of Nebraska. In football, I was an offensive running back, right and left halfback. And during that time that I was playing, we ended up having to play defense also going both ways. Happenstance would bring the two of them together later in life through a love of the University of Nebraska. The couple who reside in Florida travel back to the stadium for each home game. My son is a retired pilot for uh, Southwest Airlines, which is, allows us to fly as parents. So we have no excuses. We can fly back and see a game and fly back to Florida. We, we don't miss games. Denny and Joyce have seen the stadium and team evolve over the years. Their passion and dedication to all things Nebraska shows no signs of stopping. Listen, never coming back to a game, as long as I can walk and talk and drive and steer and ride a horse, what? I will be coming back for ride Nebraska football. <laughs> to me, this stadium is a shrine to all of oh, Nebraska. Yeah. End of story. I can be so proud that this beautiful stadium has added on very gracefully. My compliments not so much to the concrete, but to the people that sit on that concrete in that stadium. We have the best fans in the whole world. That is an awesome story. That's what makes Nebraska fan base so awesome. We thank Denny and Joyce for sharing all that with us. It's clear how special Memorial Stadium is to not only those two, but to so many Nebraskans. And on that note, we'll talk about the recent announcement, as we did earlier with Aaron, about the renovations to the stadium. I know they had to time it that way because they needed a regent meeting. At the same time, it's nice to get out of the way before the Michigan game happened. Well, and also, It's been tougher to do it this week. There's a few things. Well, first of all, Trevor Alberts, a year ago at this very time, announced that they would have a plan that they had put together for this time of year. So yes. it's not like this just came all together. I mean, a year ago on the bye week in September, they had a deal to announce the plan to make the plan. Now the plan's out. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting, though, there there is no president. So, like, all of this will go through without a Right. I mean, he's still in place. He's still in place. Kind of laying duck. Technically, yeah. until December 31st. Um, but right. if it gets to this point, you know, the regents are behind it. And you, know, you would expect the meeting Thursday just to be a formality at this yeah. point. But you knew, anyone you talked to in the construction industry familiar with this project knew it was going to be massive. Like, yeah. there was only one way to do it, and it's the right way. And the right way is you got to get rid of South Stadium yeah. and build it up. In the 60s, when that was built, it was built very quickly. Yep. Uh, after the first few sellouts of Memorial Stadium, it's never been touched since they worked on it. Mm -hmm. And it collapsed in the 90s. There was a... Luckily, with no one there. No one yeah. there. Yeah. Preseason, though. I mean, like, yeah. the concrete fell down. So mm -hmm. um, it's time, and, and yeah. it, it's needed. No excuse when it comes to recruiting, mm -hmm. when those kids are coming here and they see the big red facility and the new stadium. You got to win, though. But, you I mean, do. really, it's going to look incredible. It's going to look fantastic. I mean, what's that? Between almost three, three quarters of a... Almost a billion dollars yep. can be put into yep. the two you know, projects the, the together. Two projects together. Yep. Uh, yes, you got to start. You're going to spend the money. You got to see some ROI, return on your mm -hmm. investment. Yeah. And uh, I, th I, th I feel confident that's going to get there. Yeah. Uh, even you know, two three years down the road, I, th I think it's going to be well worth it. But yeah, you, this is this is much needed. Uh, Memorial yeah. Stadium. It's uh, I, as a big <laughs> as a big guy. Yes. Uh, I do not <laughs> like sitting in there. It is it's too tight for me. I bet. So uh, I, I'm I'm looking forward to a little more space. Get half a butt uh, cheek. Yeah, you know, some <laughs> uh, some backrests, maybe yeah. uh, some uh, some cold beverages that might get start, get served in there as well. Yeah. So uh, and good internet uh, yes. and good speakers. Yes. Yes. TVs yes. to watch. Other TVs games. would be yeah. good too. All so that would it's be good, gonna yeah. be it's it's yeah. much needed. It's yeah. you got you got to just keep evolving yeah. and uh, hopefully the 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 wins and losses the wins go up the mm -hmm. losses start coming down. This is not the Illinois team we thought we'd see at all. Um, I know they lost a lot to the draft and they lost a lot of talent. They lost their defensive coordinator, but this team does not look very good right now. No, I mean, their Florida Atlantic win was shaky. I think the Toledo game immediately, um, mm -hmm. I remember watching that in Minneapolis yeah. the next night after Nebraska played on that Thursday, and I'm like, whoa. 
you know, they just didn't look right. Now, Toledo's a good MAC program, but that got your attention, and then Penn State. But losing to a year one program with your former defensive coordinator coaching them, yeah. the way that loss happened, I mean, that – you know, but this is a, equally as big of a game for Brett Bielema as it is for Nebraska's season. I mean, for Brett Bielema, if they lose this game, knowing as we've talked about how the Big Ten's turning over with all these new teams, the West is gone, um, you know, Illinois is going to have a, a lot of work ahead of them, too. What surprised me, I know they got behind, but they kind of got away from the run game against mm-hmm. Purdue a little bit, and that's not Burke. That's not, and that's not, yeah, that's not Bielema at all. That's, I mean, that's what you know from his time at Wisconsin, is running yeah. football, controlling the, the time of possession, playing smart, disciplined football. They're averaging, what did you just say, seven Seven, seven pe- penalties for 72 yards. Yeah, that's, yards. Just, not, that's yeah. just not what you, you uh, equate to Brett Bielema-style football. Uh, so very uh, unchar- uncharacteristic, very unusual for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're trying to figure themselves out, too, who Illinois was a very good football team. And I know you know one of the guys they had last year had a pick six on, on Monday mm-hmm. Night Football, yeah. Witherspoon, but uh, he's not there anymore. Uh, but this is very surprising uh, how they're performing and, and you know not this is obviously not even Bilomo's first year they have some good top end talent though Luke Altmaier is not a bad quarterback he's very athletic uh, they're running back Josh McCray very talented as well and of course Juice Jr. is there as well so they've got some is Isaiah Williams they've got some real good talent yeah they, they have a dynamic offense you know if it gets going the problem is they just haven't been great and I do think Nebraska's pass rush um, has an opportunity after two weeks of not being a it factor yep. um, they've got to get going could Cam Lenhart if he plays, help that out. I mean, will he play? I mean, it's just, I think we've expected him to play really the last two weeks and he hasn't been able to play. How do you get the nasty? Uh, there's a question here on Facebook asking the question from Tim. How do we get nasty back in the room? You gotta practice it. It just doesn't show up. You gotta, some guys have it. Some mm-hmm. guys have it. Uh, you, got, if, you got to build it though. It's just something that just doesn't show up on Saturdays. You got to work on it. You got to, you've got to practice it. You got to practice nasty. You got to practice physical. Uh, it's just not a once a week deal. It's not a one day deal. Uh, you gotta you gotta develop it and, and build it. And uh, they're they're missing some nastiness sometimes. Are you surprised? And this is a couple questions on here about people being impatient impatient at this point. Are you surprised by how impatient? It seems like some of the fan base is after only five games of a year one. I am and I'm not. I mean that's just the nature of fans. Um, I mean, Pete, Bo Pelini was winning nine or ten and played in three conference championship games, but people were impatient because yep. they didn't win those championship games. I mean, Tom Osborne, um, you know, consistently won here, sure. couldn't beat Miami and Florida State and teams like that, and yeah. people got impatient. I mean, I, I think that's— you couldn't beat Oklahoma first. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Bob Devaney. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Nebraska fans, when you have this much passion, this yeah. much interest, guess what? It comes with a lot of opinions. Yeah. They wanted Bob Devaney gone after 67 and 68 when they went, I think, 6 and 4. Back and back, 6 and 4. 6 and 4, yeah. And then got shut out at home, too, the last time they've been shut out. Uh, what do you think in terms of improvement you need to see more for next year? O-line or D-line? Which one's more important? Do they need to get in the portal? Do they need to get that? Oh, my gosh. Boy, it's, it's like six one and a half a dozen the other. Yeah. Um, I think O-line. Yeah. I think, I think that's where I, I would go. I think what we've seen so far defensively with Tony White, I think there's some guys there, and they've shown with the young guys sure. playing early uh, and often. Um, I think they got the development and the right mindset. The O-line is just, it's just not right. And I don't think it's – they just haven't played well as a unit. I think you'll have four guys do really well in one play, and one guy just kind of yeah. has has an issue, and it just ruins the whole play. And it's it's not just one. It's just it's weird. It's, I think O line is definitely uh, an area where they could uh, kick it up a notch. Let's get your burning question, Sean. My burning question: um, Will Nebraska bounce back? How will that Sunday practice? Mm. How will this team respond? Because I feel like that could this week and the way Sunday was could be a turning point one yeah. way or the other. Right. Jeff Sims appears to be healthier. Will we see him on uh, on Friday night? It's a good question. I said, will the Titans have a big game? Titans have done well against Illinois so far this season. We'll see if that happens. Don't forget to head to our website and Facebook page to click on the prediction. Jay, Sean, and I will tell you exactly what to expect on Friday night. When Nebraska goes head-to-head with the Fighting Illini in Champaign, Illinois, kickoff for that game is at 7 p.m. Central on FS1 if you're searching for that game. The next Tuesday, tune in as we'll be right back here to recap the game against Illinois with former Husker lineman Jeremiah Searles. Also, thanks to Aaron Sorensen and our student volunteers in the call center for joining us tonight. For Jay Moore and Sean Callahan, I'm Michael Severe. Well, well, before we do that, a real quick question. So th- take that question for you. Offensive line, defensive line, what's more important? I would say offensive line as well. I mean, I think we've seen it. It feels like the same old line since 2019. It does, yeah. I mean, they, they need to change that up. 
they thought they had Walter Rouse coming yeah. here um, at left tackle from Oklahoma, and he's doing well for the Sooners. Yeah. Um, they need something like that, I think, just to give this line some new life, because I don't think the freshmen they brought in are going to be quite ready, and they're going to need one more at least tackle body, I think, to shake it up. And the portal is the – if you're going to go in the portal, find in pass rushers and O-linemen. That's really the hardest, isn't it? Yeah, and, and Nebraska has had some success, but – those two weeks in December, you better have a plan and you better roll because it's gonna. It, th- yeah. That's how everybody goes. You try to get those two those guys signed before classes start in January. Right. Completely understand. Again, thanks to Aaron Sorensen and our student volunteers in the call center for joining us tonight. For Jay Moore and Sean Callahan, I'm Michael Severe. We'll see you next week right here on Big Red Wrap Up.